Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the world's greatest investing podcast. Congratulations to all AMD shareholders. This week has been massive, massive success, massive validation of AMD's tech roadmap. No one cared about this stock other than us, uh, you guys, me, Jeremy, holy smokers. Congratulations to him, too, for betting big on AMD. No one cared. We won. But I wouldn't say we won big just yet, right? So I've been an AMD shareholder for over a decade now. I'm up something like 60x once again. I think this is going much, much higher. I think that AMD time is here. Let me explain. The number one thing that has enabled me to capitalize on what is now a 60x investment over the past decade is thinking long term and being very, very close to the fundamentals. So if you think about the latest conversation, which is, is OpenAI truly going to be able to fulfill these commitments? It's actually the erroneous question to be asking here, because AI is going to be much bigger than OpenAI. So if you look at AI at the moment, it's only like a very small percentage of companies in the US that have started to embrace it. It's only a very small percentage of consumers that are truly using it to a fraction of its potential. So this thing is actually going to get much, much bigger. So if you sort of zoom out, you have two components to the equation here as always, which is really what is AMD's technology and what does it enable them to do? And then what is truly the demand for this thing over the next decade? Because a 60X is really not that interesting or say 100X if you can obtain 1000X over the next decade, which is really what I think the total performance of my investment is going to be in the coming years. AMD is the machine that prints personalized chips at a marginal cost and offers a total cost of ownership for customers across a growing variety of specialized workloads. So what does that mean? This is, this is primarily enabled by the chiplet platform. This platform is what enabled AMD originally to disrupt Intel. It's what's now enabling AMD to become a crown jewel of the AI compute space. Chiplets basically enable AMD to mix and match compute engines at will, including memory and stuff, which I don't know if you would call exactly a compute engine, but that enables them to make chips which are highly specific and highly specialized for given workloads. And that's why, that's why they're actually cheaper to run, cheaper and more efficient to run for customers. So what we've seen over the past year or two with Meta deciding to run all of Llama 405B's inference on the MI300 or the MI350, I'm not sure which one it was, Oracle leaning in hard into AMD, now OpenAI leaning in hard. It's because of this tactical decision that AMD took to modify their chips and add more memory than anyone else in the marketplace. More memory means they can fit the entire model, basically, on chip, and so the distance elections have to go between the memory and the actual computer shorter because you don't have to go and retrieve the model from some other distant memory. It's on chip. And so the inferences are faster. But as I was saying in my last video, training is actually, actually requires making inferences too. So that is kind of coming for full circle. I think that at some point, some analysts were saying, well, I think you know, AMD has a strategic advantage in inference. It's actually tactical because they decided to add more memory. And if you take a step back, what that showcases is AMD's ability to pounce on workloads by modifying compute engines within the chip at will, sort of mixing and matching them at will and at a marginal cost in order to pounce on those workloads and just offer a total cost of ownership advantage. So if you again, if you zoom back, inference is going to be massive, but then inference is going to be distributed too. It's going to happen at the edge in small devices. And even if you think about distribution in terms of data centers. Well, some data centers are going to be massive, but other companies like Oracle will basically want to distribute the inference in data centers too. So maybe have smaller data centers that are physically cr close to where the actual inference for end consumers is going to happen. So distribution is going to be quite fractal and it's not only going to happen at the very edge, it's going to happen all the way from uh, you would say the core clusters of compute, like the actual big, big data centers to the very edge, and it's going to be highly, highly distributed. So it's, it's, I think AMD is just so well suited uh, to capitalize on distributed inference. It's going to be a massive opportunity. Uh, of course, so long as AI scaling laws persist, which is not guaranteed, but for now it's, you know, it's doing very well. So if you, if you zoom back further, again, this, to me, the bullishness here has uh, some, something to do 
with the recent open AI news, but actually it's just a broader macro thesis, which is AI is automating intelligence. It's enabling companies to get more efficient and create more value for end consumers, which is truly what's important. And, and so AMD's chiplet platform enables them to print personalized chips at a marginal cost. So say in the abstract, here's what I think is going to happen. Over the next five years, I think we're going to see some kind of new compute, AI compute workload emerge. A few years ago, no one was really thinking about inference. Now it's all the rage about inference. I think that as the agentic economy takes shape and agents start talking to each other, we're going to see new compute workloads, which are going to require specific hardware configurations. And I think we're going to see AMD pounce on that workload and take most of it. The first instance of that that I think we're going to see, and it's not technically a new compute workload, but it is a fairly new configuration, is AI at the edge. I think that's going to be massive. I think physical AI is going to be uh, one of the primary end markets for AI, and I think uh, AMD is going to be a, pri uh, a primary player there, regardless of whether OpenAI has the money or not to pay for these things. The thing with what's happening with the, you know, the deals that OpenAI is doing, which seems somewhat incestuous, and I have to say that to me it was also a little bit strange, is that the scale of what's coming right now I think is inconceivable. And I think we need our industrial titans to really work together to make this happen. This, I mean, if, if you sort of model out what's going to happen with, on the energy front, and this goes back to iron, of course, if you model out what's going to happen with energy, I think we're going to have a massive bottleneck so long as the AI scaling laws continue persisting. It's, it's almost inconceivable. But say, instead of modeling out five years, model out 15. But there's not going to be enough energy in, in the galaxy, maybe, to power this thing. It's going to be a huge, huge deal. And, and so these numbers that I think are so impressive to people are really in the very short term. So if if, to me... It's sort of the same mechanism that I used a decade ago to make this much money with this thing is, is equivalent to this now. It's basically, I'm not thinking one or two years out. I'm not thinking about ChatGPT 7 or the commitments that OpenAI is making, which again, is, is just the validation, right? It just means these guys pointed at AMD and said, these guys have tech that we want to use. That's a fair enough signal. But if you take a step back, it's the, the picture is a lot, lot bigger. And um, to me, I mean, the OpenAI thing is big news, but to me, the Oracle one was perhaps even bigger. Right? So we saw the backlog of Oracle rise very quickly, and that was also driven by, uh, by OpenAI. But, but basically, if you watch this podcast that I singled out, uh, I think it was a few weeks ago, between Mark Papermaster and, uh, and, and, and this gentleman from, from Oracle, they were, really they were talking about distributed inference. And that's really the big, big opportunity right now in the near term for AMD. It's not just the commitment from an op from open AI. It's, it's, uh, what's, if, if you sort of pause the AI revolution now, the technology we have already is enough to make companies worldwide considerably more efficient, say 50% more efficient just to be conservative. And so the CapEx we are, we are seeing being deployed now by hyperscalers is sort of a, it's a primer, it's a primer of, in the, of this industry. A lot of the CapEx that's going to be directed towards this thing hasn't been directed just yet. Um, to, to give you an example of, of what I mean by that, you, you guys know I have an AI model for my course. It's called Antonio GPT, and it's basically uh, it's a chat GPT 4.0 trained on all of my write-ups, all of my videos, the courses framework, and then increasingly proprietary data, uh, so interactions with the customers and stuff. And the feedback that I've been getting for the past week or two is, you know, I was using, this is, why, this is what my customers say, I was using chat GPT, and, and it's good, but it was kind of generic. And now I'm using yours because I think it's just a little bit more accurate. And so I find it more useful. It just shows you what a little bit of proprietary data can do. And a lot of customers don't talk to me anymore. Previously, I was answering questions and I enjoyed doing that because that actually enabled me to, one, get a feeling for how people are enjoying the product or not and actually extracting value from it. And it, it, it thus enabled me to iterate on it. Customers don't really talk to me now when they take the, the course. And that's because this thing is making my operation more efficient. And as I continue adding more and more proprietary data, and it's not even like a big deal, right? I don't have like 200 million DAOs or something like, like these big platforms have. It's just a little bit of proprietary data makes me so much more efficient when I'm sort of training a generic model with it. So that wave of innovation is now coming to the market over the next two to three years. And 
guess what customers are complaining about on the course? It's the slow inferences. They say sometimes it gets stuck, it glitches a little bit. They have to do stuff like clear the cache and stuff to make sure it works well. So that wave of innovation is coming and it's going to be largely, a lot of it is going to be built on open AI. So I, I, of course, I do, I do say they are a big player, but the point is all of that CapEx isn't going to come from open AI's pocket. It's going to come from many, many companies worldwide, worldwide, many entrepreneurs. So just the whole of basically everyone's going to be moving in this direction after this wave of CapEx. So again, it's, you have to understand that AMD's platform is, is so valuable in this economy. And it's all about printing personalized chips. Um, simultaneously, if you take a step further back, AMD's platform is enabling them to take on multiple trillion dollar AI opportunities simultaneously at a marginal cost. And so in itself, the bet is um, AMD right now is in a symmetry factory. Uh, they can take on AI PCs, they can take on, excuse me, AI powered gaming, they can take on uh, data centers, both with CPUs and GPUs. They can take on inference at the edge, inference all the way between data centers and at the edge, including micro data centers that are physically close, closer to where the inference action is going to happen. So when, when Lisa was talking about an end-to-end -end AI company, I think people were dismissing that as some sort of fluff, but it's actually a very big deal. And it's obviously much bigger than the current market cap. Um, I think when when you talk about market caps going forward in AI, um, a lot of the analysis on the bullish end is is being done with you know let's just assume that the AI scaling laws are going to continue persisting forever. I don't know if I would necessarily assume that. I I do think we are going to tend to see springs and winters going forward, but over the long term, over the next decade, which is really truly how I'm thinking about this, I think that AI gets much bigger because. If you sort of abstract yourself away from the AI label and stuff, it's not really about AI and open AI and, and these kind of heuristics that people have in their mind now. It's about compute. Are we going to have exponentially more compute in 10 years time or not? And and sort of what is what is that compute going to require? It's going to require personalization. It's going to require catering for specialized workloads at a marginal cost. So in that sense, even AMD's technology is agnostic to to these labels and to this concept of AI. It's just, you have serial compute on the one end with CPUs, you have parallelized compute on the other end, and then you you, you have all these other components of the tech stack like FPGAs, which which enable, uh, enable ser serialized compute to be merged with parallelized compute uh, at a marginal cost. So to give you an example of what that looks like in practice, you have um, AMD's AI CPUs. It's basically serial compute. So serial, as in one after the other, CPUs combined with FPGAs, which is parallelized compute. Um, by combining the two, you basically have a PC that all of a sudden can make inferences. But I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but if, if you just abstract yourself from inferences, AI, et cetera, all it's doing, it's moving, moving electrons. And you just know that the future is about combining serial compute and parallelized compute and doing so at a marginal cost and personalized, right? So that's why I sleep like a baby with my AMD investment. That's why I was able to uh, obviously hold on to this uh, over the past decade and, and really be very contrarian. So I've been banging the table a lot with AMD and that's because I really understand the value of their platform. Uh, in the context of what I think, regardless of what happens with AI, is going to be an exponential increase in the demand for compute. And truly on a first principles basis, how does this platform accelerate compute um, for customers per dollar spent in a way that's hard to replicate? So at the moment, for other players to catch up with AMD, like say NVIDIA and stuff like that on this front, they really have to go through the motions and get used to chiplets. I'm not saying people at NVIDIA are not very smart. I think they are. But I think uh, when you have a, a large company and you have a sort of combination of hardware and software and, and production at large scale and everything, it's just not easy to pivot to chiplets. So in effect, this is what I've been talking about for years, which is basically an instance of the innovator's dilemma. So a few years ago, AMD GPUs seemed like a, like a silly little toy. Uh, they were obviously powered by chiplets, not quite as good as the monolithic chips just yet, not quite as powerful, not yet as menacing. But over time, the, the performance of these chips has basically 
uh, come to be on par with NVIDIA or potentially even more in some workloads as we are seeing now. By the way, I, I don't think the signals there are quite uh, clear yet to everyone. But the strongest one was um, uh, Meta deciding to do all of inference, uh, 405Bs, llamas on, on, on the MI300 and stuff. But it, it'll become uh, increasingly apparent in my opinion. But um, now these chips are on par, now they are cheaper. The software is kind of coming along. So all of a sudden, AMD has this massive crowbar to enter an exponential market. This is an instance of the innovator's dilemma, and it happens a lot in technology, right? So when you guys may have seen me when I have a position that's doing well, one of the things I'm doing a lot is looking for potential innovators dilemmas to the company that I'm holding in question. And, you know, many times you see uh, mirages, effectively, you see ghosts, and they're not real. Uh, and then sometimes you see stuff that's very real. So the thesis over the past five years has been an S an instance, I would say, of the innovator's dilemma, and it's very much materializing now. So if you want to compete with AMD, you have to go through the same motion that they've gone through to iterate on their chiplet platform. And it's, it's, uh, it's now, you know, like when I say it's, it's exponentially harder to disrupt Palantir because they went through 20 years of iterating on their digital twin platform and now they're productizing exponentially. So with every linear step in productization, it gets logarithmically harder to emulate the, the product and, and the platform is, and especially so as it becomes a network of ontologies now. So with this company, it's very much the same. It's, you, you know, maybe it takes a few years in the abstract to get chiplets, right? But then to get chiplets, right, for a bunch of, uh, for a growing volume of specialized workloads is is very hard, right? So it's, uh, try if try getting chiplets, right, for one thing, that's hard enough on its own, but try doing it for AI, uh, for, uh, for data center GPUs, try doing it for CPUs as well in the data center side, try doing it for AI PCs, try doing it for AI at the edge, try doing it for gaming, Doing so simultaneously for all of these verticals is just very, very hard. It's a platform that these guys have been investing in quietly for a long time uh, over the past decade, and it's just not going to be easy to catch up with them now. So what we have, as I was saying, is a platform that prints personalized chips at a marginal cost and is taking on several multi-trillion dollar AI opportunities at the same time. Only one has to work for this company to go up 10 to 20x in value. I believe the odds are fairly high that a bunch of these opportunities actually work out. And so I think we're looking at a highly, highly asymmetric investment over the next five to 10 years, regardless of the labels that people are putting on this, uh, you know, talking in the abstract about AI inference, open AI, Sam Altman. I don't really, in relative terms, I don't really care about any of that. It's all about the backdrop of exponential exponentially more compute demand for the, over the next decade and how on a first principles basis, AMD is so uniquely suited to cater for it in a way that's actually quite hard to replicate now. So guys, thank you very much for joining me. Again, congratulations to all the AMD shareholders. These are sweet times. As I was saying, narratives go up and down. And even if they go down for me, I have a very clear view of this company's fundamentals. And so I'm very much long and I'm looking forward to making uh, an additional fortune with this investment. So guys, thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video, could you please share this with one friend whom you think will enjoy it? These deep dives and updates are for free. And so the only way this grows is with your help. Thank you very much in advance. Take care and see you next time.